going right into the presentation. We're going to cover 4 million years of human evolution here, starting with everyone's favorite, Lucy, discovered by Donald Johansson in 1974, Australopithecus afarensis. Her species is represented by fossils from over 400 individuals now. They lived in uh, East Africa 3.8 to 2.9 million years ago. You can notice they deceptively put long hair on Lucy because only human beings grow long hair on the top of their heads. Not a single primate does. More lies and trickery from evolutionists, no surprise there. Here's Lucy standing next to a human. As you can see, identical twins. Almost every fossil we've found that had enough spine to study, we found evidence for lumbar lordosis. That means it will adapt and change depending on one's lifestyle. So if you stand or sit upright for long periods of time, it will develop a series of curves that help the center of gravity. Well, stay centered. Even children who sit or crawl develop this. Again, this is known as lumbar lordosis. Seeing this isn't proof of bipedal evolution. It's something that develops over an individual's life depending on how they move or sit. If a primate spends most of its day sitting upright, or if a monkey stands on two legs, as some of the street performers or circuses force them to do, they will get lumbar lordosis. Lucy is nothing but a primate that lived its life in the trees that also was able to sit for long periods of time just like baboons today do. So what did Lucy spend most of her time doing? Well, sitting in trees for most of the days, staying away from predator, and standing to see over tall grasses while on the ground. Australopithecus actually means southern ape. And she has proven to be nothing but an extinct form of ape, which closely resembles many modern day chimpanzees in height, arm length, skull shape, teeth, mandible size, structure, and many other details. Was Lucy a chimp? No, Lucy wasn't a chimp. Of course she was a chimp. She lived mostly in the trees and sitting down. She has a powerful upper body, spent most of time from climbing in the trees. She even died falling out of a tree. <laughs> no evidence that Lucy was ever a, a knuckle-walking chimp. Nope, and she didn't need to be because she lived in trees and when she stood on the ground she stood upright to look over the tall grasses for predators, but most of her life was probably spent sitting. Lucy's feet were not like ours, unlike what Bill here is trying to say. Look at the toe, it's not like ours and it doesn't line up. It's off to the side, just not as off to the side as most primates. That means nothing. said Lucy combined walking on two legs with a significant amount of tree climbing. The debate about whether Lucy's species spent most of their time walking on land or in the trees has continued since her discovery in 1974. However, since further measurements and x-ray CT scans of her upper arms, scientists have somewhat confirmed Lucy's arms to be more similar to those of primates. So here's Heidelbergensis. These are ancestral to Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis and they were around from about 700,000 to 200,000 years ago. Nothing but just a regular human that they've made into a half human, half ape. This is not a different species. It was able to mate with humans, just like Cro-Magnum, Neanderthal, and Denisovan. No different at all. Homo rudolfensis, which some people will consider Homo habilis, again, at 1.9 million years ago, so just under two million years. Neither of these things could speak. They could never use fire. They never had clothing. They never had music. They never created art. Everything about them is a pure assumption, especially about them making tools. It's an ape in every sense of the word. The new evidence showing that their coexistence with Homo erectus evolving from Homo habilis has been debunked, so there goes that opinion of yours. Habilis is a joke. I can't believe you're using this for evidence. It has a primate hand, a primate skull, primate teeth. It's short. It even has fewer ribs. Habilis is used as a smorgasbord for body parts by evolutionists. Every time they find something strange and don't know how to classify it, it gets tossed in with the habilis bin. The funny part about this ape is that it eats over 80 to 90% of its calories from tiger nuts. Therefore, I challenge you as a human being right now, go on Amazon and buy just a small bag of tiger nuts. Open up that bag and eat it. Eat the entire bag. I dare you. You will quickly realize that that is nothing close to a human being. And just to cover again, if you, if you line these skulls up, 
Africanus, Habilis, Erectus, and I do this at the museum when I'm when I'm speaking there and, and talking with children there, that a, an eight or ten year old can put them back in the in the right order. Yeah, that's because what you did isn't actually science. I guess by your standard, children are good scientific tools for discovery now, huh? Neanderthals, uh, everybody's favorite caveman here, found in uh, Europe and Western Asia, went extinct by 39,000 years ago. This is the most complete Neanderthal skull here, discovered in 1909, 70,000 years old. Cranial capacity over 1,600 cc's. So actually a lot of these uh, early Neanderthals had a, a brain size larger than modern humans. Comparison with modern humans, different species. Everything that he's mentioning thinks it's helping his argument. It's not. It's showing how superior ancient man is. Proving our side. Because Neanderthal were better, smarter, and faster than us in every way. Even running. Anthropologist Peter McAllister recently published a book titled Manthropology, The Science of Inadequate Modern Man. An analysis of the footsteps of one of the men's footprints was preserved in a fossil clay pan lake bed in Australia, dubbed T8. It shows signs that the runner reached speeds of 37 kilometers per hour in a soft, muddy lake edge. Yes, he was moving at 23 miles per hour. Neanderthal were extremely fast and extremely strong, far superior than people today. Evolutionist George Johnson perhaps unwittingly illustrated this in his biology book, The Living World, when he wrote, Thoroughbred racehorses are all descendants of a small initial group of individuals, and selected for speed, it has accomplished all it can with a limited amount of genetic variability. The winning times in major racehorses ceased to improve decades ago. We think that pre-flood man lived about 900 years, some of them. In order for this to be true, pre-flood man's physiology had to be superior than ours. Neanderthal had better bone structure, and their bones were thicker and stronger than ours. They had better muscle tone. Neanderthal have up to 50% more asymmetry, better occlusion, stronger teeth, and larger brain cavity. This makes a valid argument saying that Neanderthals were smarter than us because it's been linked that brain size and intelligence are correlated. We have now found evidence that Neanderthal DNA is 99.5% identical with present day humans, and that Neanderthal DNA appears to fall inside the variation of present day humans. Neanderthal had less hair on their backs than present day humans do in theirs. This is due to a genetic marker RS4849721. This marker is shared by Neanderthal and present day humans. For example, if you have a T at this marker position, you probably have less hair than average. Neanderthals have the T, which means they too probably had far less back hair than the average present day human. Hmm, so that's much less hairy of an ape man, don't you think? Homo naledi is a real recent one discovered in 2013, described by Lieberger in 2015. When they were first uh, discovered, we, we didn't know how old they were. Um, again, dated by six different methods now. They've got them down to a range between 235 and 335,000 years ago. They were found in the Rising Star Cave uh, in South Africa near Johannesburg. And over 1,500 fossil specimens from 15 individuals are brought up, and Lee Berger says there's more down there. There's another fossil Lee Berger discovered. That was me right there. I, I was his opening act at the uh, Mesa Arts Center back in March here. Of course you would back a known fraudulent scam artist in the field of evolution and believe what he says. Come on, man, really? Just investigate him for a minute. Pythicus sediba was a fairly new one, discovered 2008 by eight-year-old Matthew Berger, son of Lee Berger. Oh great, the son of a notorious fraud has found the next missing link, I'm sure. Do we look like Neanderthals um, as we age? 
Uh, Ken has made the statement many times in his videos that eyebrow or eyebrow ridges continue to grow as we get older. That is false. False again. Let's look at some Neanderthal children. Oh, look at that. No brow ridge. Imagine that. Let's compare a real human being alive today with a brow ridge, shall we? Look at that. It appears that you can grow a brow ridge as you get older. Here's Jason Momoa from Aquaman. As years pass, facial bones actually lose volume. Now what might happen is the eye sockets get larger. This is ridiculous. First of all, you took somebody at the prime of their life and then compared it to an old person who's degenerating. You're seeing osteoporosis and bone degenerative diseases, and then you're comparing it to our model, which says that people are in their prime for hundreds of years. And modern day people eat tons of grain. It's the base of our food pyramid. People eat tons of grain, which has phytates and leaches nutrients from the bone. And they consume tons of dairy, which has the exact same effect, leaching calcium from the bone. That's why Denmark, Norway, and Sweden have the highest amount of bone degenerative diseases, osteoporosis, and hip fractures. So this uh, comparison is ridiculous. Uh, our Neander Neander Neanderthals don't have chins. No chin. You mean not a strong chin? How about Australian Aboriginals, who also have a weak chin, even today, and a strong brow ridge? They also had the larger brow ridge, so again, brow ridge prominence, you wouldn't see the difference. So are you trying to tell us that we can't find people alive today with protruded brow ridges, like the old race of human Neanderthal had? This is absolutely insane. No modern human remains have ever been found in the same layers, originating from the same layers as Australopithecus afarensis. Well, I got some bad news for you. Most people have never heard of the Ashley Phosphate Beds of South Carolina, which is a shame because it is the best piece of evidence to ever exist currently that man has lived alongside of dinosaurs without question. The Ashley Phosphate Bed is the largest graveyard ever found. 
This information has been forgotten by the sands of time, but I am going to bring it back. Today, the Ashley phosphate bed is mined for its high quantities of phosphate, which is being used for fertilizer, so there is great money to be made. These sedimentary layers are huge, covering large portions of the Carolinas and extending into Florida all the way up into Canada. World-famous geologist at the time, Louis Agassiz, described the phosphate beds as the greatest graveyard he had ever known. The phosphate beds are so full of bones that it is believed by scientists that the phosphate itself is made from bone. So, if the Ashley phosphate bed is loaded with such an incredible amount of fossils as to cause the leading geologist and zoologist of his day to call them the greatest graveyard he had ever known, you should ask yourself, why has zero mention of this ever been brought up? The fossils completely ravage the evolutionary timeline. That's why. Remember, if the geologic column is out of place, even in one area on Earth, then it falsifies the theory of evolution and that the layers form slowly and that they represent time. Well, when you look at this one place where there's an 18 inch thick layer, you will see why it's suppressed. In it are rare fossils of everything from whales and porpoises, fish, sharks, megalodon shark, toads, crocodiles, alligators, turtles, rabbits, monkeys, horses, camels, elephants, mammoth, mastodon, rhinoceroses, giant sloth, muskrats, deer, pig, dogs, hadrosaur dinosaurs, iguanodon dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, ichthyosaurs, and human bones, teeth, and artifacts all within the same layer. Professor S.F. Holmes, the paleontologist and curator of the College of Charleston's National History Museum, described the fossil graveyard in a report to the Academy of Natural Sciences. He stated, Remains of the hog, the horse, and other animals of recent date, together with human bones, mingled in with the bones of mastodon and extinct giant lizards. And this is on record. The occurrence of a hadrosaur dinosaur remains in the Ashley phosphate beds has not been dealt with in the secular science literature really at all. Only two sources exist. They have kept it silent, which is typical. The sad part is, when they first uncovered the relics of the human bone, they immediately became afraid. They, without hesitation, considered their jobs to be at a loss, so they said that the bone was out of place to one another. They immediately threw it in the river to be erased from history and hidden from all view. They knew that such a find would cause them to either probably lose their jobs or their grant funding. And this is all the way back in the late 1800s, they were still in fear of the government from evolutionary dogma, as Darwin's theory had now taken hold. The scientists who studied this knew exactly what they had found. This is why their deep concern for finding such anomalies. Professor of Geology and Paleontology F.S. Holmes believed in the conventional evolutionary sequence. So he knew full well that humans and dinosaurs should not be found in the same layer. In fact, he wrote, Not long after finding the above-named relics of human workmanship and engaged in our usual visits to the Ashley bed, a bone was found projecting from the bluff, immediately in contact with the surface of the stormy stratum. We pulled it out and behold, a human bone. Without hesitation, it was condemned an accidental occupant of quarters to which had no right, geologically. And so, we threw it into the river. Alas, we have lived to regret our temerity and rashness. A year later, a lower jawbone with teeth was taken from the same bed, and now we have it in the cabinet. After the news became public, I guess Holmes saw no reasons to cower from his discovery anymore, as Holmes portrayed a dinosaur with a man on the cover of his own book. Evolutionists have admitted that if dinosaurs are ever found with humans, then they would admit that the Noah's Flood was real and that man did live alongside of dinosaurs, and that the biblical timeline is true. 
because this evidence would validate that the Earth is young and that they had been lied to about our ancient history, there is no rescuing device for them, either, because the Ashley phosphate beds had no layers to them. All of the fossils are mixed together in one huge pool of bones, 18 inches thick, covering 200 miles, with no layers found anywhere. The experts who spent considerable time excavating in the phosphate beds have said that there are no layers, and not even a remote resemblance of a layer. It is all one graveyard. You can learn more about the Ashley Phosphate Bed in a book called Man, Dinosaur, and Mammals Together, written by the late geologist John Watson, available at Mount Blanco Fossil Museum. A statement from the book says, Since remains of land animals and sea animals were found together, a catastrophic event would have included the burial of enormous numbers of animals and their subsequent conversion into the rock phosphate over a region of the least 200 miles by 30 miles in extent, which is only partially exposed apart. Such an event is of the order and magnitude of the worldwide noetic flood. So we can continue to listen to Bill here, who even admits, I'm not a professional scientist. Or we can listen to an actual scientist who in the field states, Living fossils is just one of four simultaneous experiments that I carried out to test evolution. It was based on a simple prediction that if evolution was not true, and if animals did not change over time, I should be able to find modern appearing plants and modern appearing animals in the dinosaur rock layers. And this is in fact what I found. First I found a fossil shrimp in a dinosaur rock layer that looked very similar to a modern appearing gulf shrimp. Then I found a crayfish in a dinosaur layer that looked like a modern crayfish. Then a crab, then a prawn, then a lobster. Soon I realized I had found all of the major crustacean groups in the dinosaur rock layers. Then I turned my attention to the insects. First I found a modern appearing dragonfly that was found in a dinosaur rock layer. Then a katydid, then a cockroach, then a cricket, and soon I had representatives of all of the major insect groups living today from the dinosaur rock layers, and they looked the same. Then I had representatives of all the shellfish groups, the echinoderm groups, etc. And soon I realized that I had representatives of all of the major invertebrate phyla living today I'd found these in the dinosaur rock layers and they look the same. Next, I turned my attention to the vertebrates and here I ran into problems. Museums were, for the most part, not displaying the most important vertebrate fossils. They were kept out of the view of the public. So I turned to the literature and began interviewing scientists, asking if they had seen any modern appearing vertebrates with the dinosaurs. And lo and behold, they had. Dr. Clemens reported finding a modern appearing parrot in a dinosaur rock layer. Others reported finding ducks, loons, flamingos with dinosaurs. This was utterly amazing. And others reported finding shrew-like animals, squirrel-like animals, platypus-like mammals, and other mammals in the dinosaur rock layers. Now, I did not find any of the larger mammals in the dinosaur rock layers, but this could just as easily be explained by a misinterpretation of the geological layers, which I'll explain in the fourth video. Lastly, I turned my attention to the plants, and once again, I found representatives of all of the major plant divisions living today in the dinosaur rock layers, and they looked the same. Sequoias with dinosaurs, oak trees with dinosaurs, magnolias, dogwoods, etc. It was, it was amazing. In summary, I predicted that if evolution was not true, I would find modern appearing plants and modern appearing animals in the dinosaur rock layers. And this is in fact what I found. I have proven, it's proven. You have the fossil record, it shows all the steps. Fossils don't prove evolution. Fossils don't mean anything as far as evolution is concerned. We don't need them. Forget fossils. They just aren't important. 
we have a very good set of bones saved from fossil records showing that the whales evolved through a long period of time from animals that were on land to animals that are in the water. Fossils don't mean anything as far as evolution is concerned. We don't need them. Evolution is very much a part of that tradition. We are constantly revising. Tradition, you don't have to trust tradition. I mean, what the, I mean, come on, there's tradi different traditions all over the world. So you start from very simple life and eventually you get everything that we have around us, from elephants to alligators to chimpanzees and, and everything in between. According to Chen, the fossils he's discovered turn Darwin's tree of life upside down. Darwin is a tree, you know, uh, reverse the condition very unexpectedly. Our research convincing uh, major phyla starting down below at the beginning of Cambria. Base is white, gradually narrow, so this is almost uh, turned on different way. <laughs>